Off we go. Here we go. Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here in, on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters, and we have this week regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, representative for Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Good morning, Olga. Good morning. And... All the way from Burlington, Representative Joey Donovan, who represents District 65 in Burlington. Welcome. Glad to have you on the show today, Thank Joey. You. Glad to be here. All good. Thank you. So let's kick this off. It's been an interesting, to say the least, um, few months in the labor market with the pandemic and so many people being laid off um, and, and just the economy and business kind of up in the air. <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, you know, let's let's um, talk a little bit about unions and the labor movement in Vermont, which we should just note for those who, who uh, are ke- keeping track, Vermont is an at-will state, um, which we'll talk about a little bit in a moment. But um, Emily, just Give us a little grounding on what the labor movement in Vermont looks like right now. Um, I'm going to do a little bit and then ask Joey to join in because she's been um, in the movement a little bit longer than I have. But one thing that we really saw over the last six months of having conversations about where a billion dollars in federal money should go is this big tension between, you know, does it go directly into the hands of people? Does it go into the hands of businesses? And that really sort of reflects this ongoing tension between labor and management, but we don't tend to use those words anymore. Hmm. And as we, partly because Vermont is so many small businesses um, and partly because of, I think some cultural things around, you know, rural life and people feeling like they can go at it alone and culture um or just don't want anyone telling them what to do or don't want anyone telling them what to do i you know and nash huge national trends that we can get into around deregulation and reaganomics and etc we the labor movement has um slowly shrank in the u.s um over the last hundred years from it's you know when we got the 40-hour work week um, and, but there are pieces that we've had, you know, teachers are unionized, nurses are unionized, um, and we've seen a resurgence in the union movement. Um, Black Lives Matter came out of the domestic workers union. And today in the middle of the pandemic, what we've seen is the push for workers protections is coming from the front lines of unions who have the power to say, we can, we are not going to work unless we are protected. And that's for me, that issues around hazard pay, issues around safe working conditions is at the heart of why we need unions so that they can really help balance that power between workers and management. Um, So we are in some ways not where we were 30 years ago and in some ways we're in a better position. So Joey, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Well, no, I think you've covered it well. I I think that nationally we've had um, a big drop in unions over time, and I think mostly it's been because of attacks of very well financed um, management types. The Koch brothers immediately come to mind, and um, I, I think people have sort of lost the idea of all that labor unions have brought to working people um, over the last century or more. Um, they brought, I think not only the 40 hour uh, work week, but a lot of the safety issues that have been brought and working conditions that um, enhance the daily life of people going to work every day. And Vermont has never been a big union state. I think most of our unions now are, as Emily said, public service type unions, but we still, what the unions bring first of all, really then trickles down to um, working Vermonters everywhere. And I often think that um, this last, couple of uh, months of legislating, it's really been brought that a lot of those people that were frontline workers were work, were women. They're oftentimes single heads of household, raising children. And this has been a really difficult time for them. And I think um, some of the um, influences, what we ended up doing for hazard pay and things that were really promoted by 
unions really have helped those those women in those positions getting some extra pay and some extra help raising their families. And there's, you know, there's <clears throat> issues that feel like details to many folks who have never had the experience of engaging with it, but workers' compensation is yeah. an incredibly powerful protection for folks who get injured on the job that comes from the union yeah. movement. And that is protected really every single day um, nationally and in Vermont by the labor movement. Unemployment insurance, um, it is what it is and it's not as good as it should be, but that's something that's protected every day by the labor movement. And the hazard pay started in union shops and then we were able, because of them sort of pushing the waters, able to expand it to more folks. Yeah. I think too, the, um, one of the most important bills we passed this year is the new um, labor organizing bill, which was really um, allowed unions to um, have, have conversations, even in big institutions like our hospitals and some of our universities. <clears throat> It has been difficult um, for unions to go in and talk to people about the benefits of a union and having them sign a card to say they intend, they want to, they want to organize, they want to be part of this. And oftentimes um, some very um, high level um, institutions have sort of made it more difficult for them to do that. And it, that's been a big concern of mine over the last recent years. And um, so this bill makes it um, much easier to have those conversations. And I think that's an important step forward. So why, um, let's just dip into the kind of the culture of Vermont for a second and, and working in Vermont. You know, Emily and I have often joked on this show that, uh, you know, the good old joke, moonlight in Vermont or starve. You know, most people are working two or three jobs. Um, but for a place like Vermont, are unions um, even appropriate? Are they useful? Do we have enough of a population to build um, enough of a, a collective uh, in a, in, with all our small businesses? Do you kind of see what I'm, I'm, I'm pulling at? One thing I try to remind our colleagues in the legislature at least once a week, and I'm curious, Joey, what phrase you've used over the years to reflect this idea is um, we hear a lot from business owners in our communities or say landlords in our communities um, every day. And we get lobbied that way a lot, or we hear from industry associations a lot. And what I try to remind my colleagues every day is I promise you there are more workers in your community than there are managers and owners, unless you live in Woodstock. And I say that, you know, at least once a week. And that to me is like the essence of really the power and the usefulness of a union is to really make sure that what is clearly a clear power imbalance in terms of who gets to make decisions is sort of righted by the volume of people, the volume of workers that you have in a system. And that's very abstract. Um, a more concrete way of describing it is, you know, when I first started working in Vermont, I was waiting tables. Um, and it's an incredibly vulnerable position to be in. You don't have control over your schedule. You don't have control over your income. You don't have control really over your own body. It's a place with incredible levels of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And when you push back in those instances, it's very, very easy to have your hours, you know, you're so vulnerable to having your hours reduced, to losing your job entirely, to be moved to shifts where you make less money. And that's a, just a great example of what a lot of people experience in a lot of jobs, especially the service industry, which Vermont mm -hmm. has <clears throat> so many people working in. And so that's what, it, for me, that's what union is. It's to help you come together with the folks you work with to say, I, you know, I deserve some respect here. And, and I would say, I, I don't think there's any setting too small for um, an organization of workers. Um, Vermont prides itself on being a state of small business owners, and I have enormous respect for those people, and I understand um, the difficulties of being a small business owner. Um, but I, I have to say that 
over my 20 years in legislature, we have raised the minimum wage at least twice. And um, the argument has always been the same. You know, it's going to put small business people out of business. They can't, simply can't afford it. And my point has always been that this is money that's not gonna go to Wall Street. It's not gonna leave the state. It is going to be recycled right in the downtown village center uh, the week after it happens. And it is going to be a boom for the whole community and um, that we don't need to be afraid of that. And um, I think I've been proven right each time, mm -hmm. but still we always, we have the same argument and the fears. Um, and uh, so I, I appreciate, um, I always kind of frighten some of my opponents now because I ha have a, a small real estate business. And so I go up to them now and identify myself as a small business owner. <laughs> and they become quite frightened at the thought of that. But um, it really is interesting. And it does um, open up our conversations about issues. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So what do you feel now is, uh, for lack of a better phrase, the next step? for the labor movement in Vermont. Um, in some ways it feels sometimes like we don't really have one. Um, so do we need more organizing or do we need more education or do we need um, to help people see what benefits they could actually receive from, from being in a union? Like where do we go, where do we go next? I think education is always really important, but I think most Vermonters know about unions when their local teachers go on strike or st start to ask for more benefits. Um, I often think about sometimes the protection for teachers and especially in some of our small towns is without some organization um, protecting you, uh, there could be a very prominent business person that you have a conflict with their child in school and without that protection of a union, you might have to pack to the next town or next county or perhaps even the next state if you know, with those conflicts. Um, interestingly enough, in Burlington a couple of years ago, we did finally have a teacher's strike after um, probably two or three years of very acrimonious negotiation. And at that time, it was quite amazing because the teachers had over almost 90% of the support of the Burlington taxpayers. And I think it had been such a long discussion and negotiation that people had a, had a um, time to really understand what the issues were. And they simply didn't agree with the disrespect the school board was showing the teachers that taxpayers knew personally and knew from relationships with their kids. So, um, you know, I, I think the more people think about that and understand that, the better it is, but education is is a tough is a tough thing to hold. And as you say, most people don't identify Vermont as a union state. And so, with that education, I think that gives us more opportunities for folks to come together to form unions, um, and for those unions to come together with each other. So those are for me the sort of two biggest cutting edges: is um, our unions in Vermont are starting to work together more and more to um, look at the real structural inequities rather than just the individual problems in their individual shops. And that's where so much change can happen. And I think most Vermonters are aware of and really concerned with the increasing economic inequity in our state and in our nation. And this is a really clear possible way to organize. You know, in Brattleboro, so many folks like to get out in the streets and, you know, um, protest, rally, parade, it's one of our, um, it's what makes Brattleboro, Brattleboro. But it's a, usually a fairly select group of people and unions can really help diversify the voices that are at a table on a given issue because they build solidarity across um, gender, across race, across <clears throat> life history, because it's, you know, the people that you know at work are the, people that you spend most of your time with. And when you can sort of come into social change with those people, it can be really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. Well, it also, something like that type of work 
protests and rallies are really great for pulling people together, but at some point you have to do the work of change. Absolutely. And that's, um, I think unions give people the enough of an organizational system together that they're then able to do the work of change. Um, so it's, you know, you're working for change and then you pick it and then you work for change some more. So it's part of like a real, um, a real structure. Life cycle of change. Indeed, indeed. Um, but it's hard to unionize in Vermont. Um, you know, we're at a will at will state, as you said. I think Joey's been sponsoring legislation to change that for twenty years now, Joey. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, let's step back for a second and give a definition of of at will and and kind of the ramifications of that. I mean, I think it just it gives the um, the balance of power to the employer, and that they can fire any employee for um, at will. With they do not have to give just cause or any reason for it. And so that really, you can imagine, puts the worker at a great disadvantage. Thank you, Joey. So if folks are trying to come together and form a union, or even just trying to come together and advocate for any rights, changes, structure, complaints, improvements, often the best improvements in a business come from the folks who are you know, in the field working directly with customers or clients, um, when folks voice those, they're making themselves so vulnerable in an at-will state because they can be you know, fired on the spot for speaking up, speaking out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, um, this Working Vermont Caucus that Emily and I belong to. And that you founded? Well, I did not, I give that credit to a, um, progressive uh, representative from Burlington at the time, Steve Hinchin. Um, I certainly supported Steve and, and was there when it happened. But it really was um, not only to further the labor organization, but to give a, um, a group of legislators who had similar feelings, some kind of um, moment to be able to discuss issues, to work with labor and listen to what they needed to sort of, um, uh, point out legislation that might be being proposed that had negative impacts to workers. And again, to um, also, as you say, to let other members um, get to know the labor union, get to know the values of working people. I think um, most legislators come from a background of uh, middle class and certainly non-union homes. And um, so I think it's imperative, and we've often looked at this from the Working Vermont Caucus, that we have a responsibility to <clears throat> educate those uh, legislators and also to have them get to know labor. And we say to get to know the face of labor. We have um, a number of lobbyists in the building that are associated with labor. And we want um, democratic representatives to be able to identify those lobbyists and to be able to be on a um, personal relationship with them. You know, we don't have staffs in the Vermont legislature. I always love getting mail from national organizations that say, <laughs> could we get in touch with your staff? And what is the address of your office? And it's like, my office is my seat in the chamber with the desk that opens and shuts. And um, uh, there, there's, there's no district office. We really work very limited. And so a lot of the research that we get on bills is oftentimes from the lobbyists. And that sounds kind of fishy and funny, but nevertheless, a lobbyist who ever steers you wrong knows you're never going to have any business with them again. And so remarkably, it works. And some of the finest background I've gotten on issues has come from a lobbyist. Sometimes I'll absolutely disagree with them because of the um, information they give me. But it's hard pressed where we, we have to do our own research. And sometimes that's, you just don't have time to do that. So um, we have sponsored over the years um, uh, different parties where we invite people to a social um, environment so that they can get to know these labor leaders and lobbyists and start to have that conversation of knowing they're not demons, they don't have horns, and they have the best interests of Vermont at, you know, really at the heart of everything they're doing. So um, those are some of the things that we do, which have been kind of successful and kind of fun to do. 
Because an owner of a business um, or a lobbyist for say the Chamber of Commerce, for instance, has the time to be in the building, um, mm -hmm. can take time off to be in the building because they're in charge of their own schedule. They might have a lot of work to do and I'm not saying it's not a burden to come up to testify regardless, but it, they at least have the freedom to make their own schedule to come testify. And folks who are punching in and punching out on a time clock are not able to do that very often. And so by being organized and by having folks in the building, um, it really gives an opportunity to make sure that workers' voices are there who might not have the time or ability to do it themselves. Yeah. And then also, you know, when we help introduce other legislators to unions, it means that then maybe in their own districts, they'll take the time to seek out those folks who are working in their communities on a weekend or in an evening. Mm -hmm. So for some people, the word union is very contentious. Um, and when I say for some people, I'm talking about managers and workers and everyone. Um, so how do you answer, and, and I think the concerns are many. The concerns are, you know, my needs still won't get met, but I'll have less freedom to make my own choices, I think is kind of the biggest fear I hear in my very unscientific mm -hmm. listening. Um, and yeah, that kind of loss of control, I think, is, is the fear I hear the most. Um, how, how, can, you, can you respond to that? Can you answer that concern at all? either of you? I, I would just say, I, I don't quite understand the loss of control um, because uh, you're gaining so, so much more power and actual control over your destiny, I think, if you have joined with your, um, your fellow workers and, and go to the boss um, with um, 50 of you rather than you alone. Um, um, so I guess I, I kind of, um, don't understand the premise of the uh, original thought that you're losing control. And I, I maybe people aren't aware that um, within a unionized organization, the folks who are advocating to management in a larger shop are democratically elected by the membership. Yes, good point. And so it's not, um, so it gives you even more power. You don't elect your boss. I mean, I guess there's a very few, in a cooperative, you elect your boss, but in any other form of business or nonprofit, you don't elect your boss. You, you know, are given whoever the winds of change drift you towards. And in a union shop, the sort of, the person who's at the table fighting for you is someone that you chose with your vote the same way, you know, in an ideal democracy, that's how it would work. And so, it really takes the democratic form of governance that we believe in so strongly in America to make decisions about law and brings it into the workplace in a really meaningful way. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back to that, that concept of, of loss of control only because I think it's an important one and I may not have expressed it well. So while you were talking, I was trying to think of examples I have heard over the years from folks with that worry. So for example, um, I'm just thinking of, of one person who is a member of the union and they wanted to work overtime because they wanted the money, needed the money, whatever. Um, and there were limits on, on kind of like what type of overtime and how long they could do from the union. And not being part of this union, I can't give you more like details than that. But you know, that's what I mean. They wanted to make that choice of how they worked and how they brought money into their home, and they felt they couldn't do that uh, because so, of the union. So without so that's a union, kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, mm -hmm. without a union, overtime wouldn't be a thing. <laughs> Fair enough. Right. Yeah. Without a union, without the union movement, you would get paid the same. You could be mandated to work eighty hours a week and not get paid any more for that at all. Um, it's a union, you know. So there's that side of it that even the structure of overtime comes from unions, um, and then the actual control yeah. over deciding whether or not you're going to work overtime comes from unions being able to say, yes, I wanna work overtime or no, I don't wanna work overtime and having permission to say no to an employer about that comes from unions. And then 
a more sort of contemporary example of that is there's been a push to make people salaried employees so that you don't have to pay them overtime. And that phenomenon with salaried employees was yeah. coming down to people who are making like $15,000 a year, $20,000 a year. And so, which takes away all of the protections related to overtime, related to control, all of that. And nationally, the labor movement has come together and really pushed and pushed mm. the administration. And Obama was able to do a little bit of work to push that tide back. And now it's around like 40 something thousand dollars a year that you can be a salaried employee. And I also think that at times um, overtime without um, a, an employee being able to make comments about it can also be dangerous, especially in construction and trades where, um, you know, that if you're working long hours, your ability to really be at your best is um, compromised. And out of that, there can be um, some very bad um, outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, I, I hear you. Uh, I'm not sure though that you're hearing what that person's concern is that they still felt like, um, and maybe, you know, one thing I've been thinking about, especially for these last four years, given our national situation, I've been thinking a lot about leadership and the quality of leadership. Mm -hmm. And it could just be that the folks who have, who have spoken with these concerns did not have good leadership in their own union. They did not have good leadership in their own management. But, but I do think that is, is worth considering if people, you know, if you want to move the labor movement forward, and yes, we can say, oh, overtime would not exist without unions. And that's, that's a really important achievement. But if people are still feeling like, well, I have this boss, and they don't, I, my needs are not being met, like financially, socially, balance between work and family is not being met with this boss but then I have another structure that I'm a part of that is still not helping me mm -hmm. like that's you know how are you going to move a labor movement forward if people are feeling that way or I, if that's their experience is, is probably the better way to put it yeah I mean scarcity is real across the board um and so there's only so much that a union can do in negotiations with management. And I think it speaks to so much that's happening in America right now that the blame would then go on the union rather than on the management of what the organization if something is not working right, right? Mm -hmm. um, the same way, you know, we all sort mm -hmm. of blame each other at the bottom for whatever else is happening too. Um, and, you know, that goes across race lines that, you know, it's just, it's what's, it's the culture of America right now that we blame our neighbors rather than blaming um, the CEO of Amazon for our, for the challenges that we're facing, or, you know, we blame our neighbor for not recycling rather than like multinational corporations for their emissions. So it's, um, I think that one of the and maybe this is why I ran for office and maybe this is part of why you ran for office, Joey, like on some level, if you do, the union's not doing things the way you want the union to do things, then like step up and step into leadership at your union. Like that's your ability. You can't step into management by just deciding to, but you can step into union leadership if you decide to, and you can make change there so that what's happening there does meet your needs. Thank you. Joey, I would love to hear your response, but unfortunately we, we have to go to break. So if you can hold okay. your thought, uh, the Mount Pe Montpelier Happy Hour will return on WBEW LP Brattleboro 107.7 in a moment. Thank you, everyone. Hang tight. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW LP Brattleboro 107.7 your community radio station. You can also find us on the Vermontitude Facebook page, Emily's YouTube channel and BCTV. And as always, the feelings and opinions and words expressed on this show are ours and not the radio station. I remember to do that this time, Emily. Okay. <laughs> so Joey, I'd love to, so before the break, we were just kind of digging into to some folks' uh, concerns about unions um, and negative concerns. 
um, rightly or wrongly. And, you know, Joey, I, we didn't have a chance to hear from you. And, and during the break, you mentioned some of the um, kind of legacy in popular culture around unions and how unions are portrayed. And I'd love if you could share that with, with well, our I was, listeners. I was just thinking of the blockbuster movie a few years ago, um, probably more than a few years ago now, but that about it was entitled Hoffa and told the story of Jimmy Hoffa, who was a labor union and a, a crook to be quite frank. And also um, on Netflix, I think quite recently was The Irishman, if I'm getting that right, with yeah. Robert De Niro, which again movie. talked about uh, unions and it also Hoffa played a role in that movie. And it was not flattering to unions. It was really uh, more about the corruption that existed. Um, I guess in any type of organization, there's always that threat of corruption. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job, I think, of, of making that um, uh, being policed better these days. And I think as Emily has continually said, labor members can always, you know, overthrow their, um, their union. I think Hoffa and corrupt leaders like them, as they were stealing money from the union, uh, they also were making sure though that they were listening to the union members and getting them better um, better labor contracts. And so the union felt that they were, members felt they were being benefited by, by the leadership. I remember as a younger person, um, I was a fan of uh, Robert Kennedy and he came to um, uh, public knowledge because of his crusade against corruption in labor unions, where he was a lawyer for a Senate committee um, looking into that. And he then wrote a book called The Enemy Within, which talked about that. And that was in the early 60s. So um, I think we've made great um, progress. And I think of labor leaders like Walter Ruther from the um, automobile workers, who was just an upstanding man. And you know, we, we haven't had any movies about Walter Ruther, unfortunately. No, and even when we talk about Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we um, generally the bio biopics, biopics. Um, the history of his work really stops with race and never moves into where he really spent the final months and years of his life, which was deeply focused on organizing workers yeah. and saying that like, we are not going to move forward with civil rights until we really take care of class in this country and income. And so there are, there have been amazing labor leaders. And in the last, um, for me, in the last 20 years, I've been thrilled to see how many women have come into this work um, and how the organizing of domestic workers, the organizing of restaurant workers, how much that has shifted some of the dynamics in labor unions. And I think sometimes people, some of the challenges that happen for people are when unions have really become dominated by one particular perspective on things rather than take especially larger unions rather than looking at the collective whole and health of the people who work there. But again, that is, you know, the culture is shiftable by the people working within it in a way that is much more possible in a democratic organization such as a union than it is um, in a hierarchy of power where the people on the bottom don't have a say in shifting that culture. And so even when there are challenges, and there are because it's humans and it's humans organizing themselves and humans are deeply flawed, we, there's also all of that hope and possibility of people being able and willing and stepping up and say, this is not representing my needs and interests, um, whether that's as a person of color, or as a woman, or um, as a person who's working this particular job when most of the union is representing another um, position. Thank I you, also, Emily. yeah. Let's talk a little bit about sort of some of the laws that govern unions that um, feel like really in the weeds for people and are a little bit complicated if you haven't been a union member that I think are really important for people to know about. So Vermont's an at-will state. Um, most states are, there's only a few states in the country that aren't at this point. Um, and that has nothing to do with union organizing or not union organizing or the ability to form a union. An at-will state just means you can be fired at any time for any reason. Um, and why unions are great in an at-will state is because generally the negotiated contract the union negotiates for the workers says you can't be fired at any time for any reason. 
And right. so it's a way of sort of protecting from a law that really endangers the um, quality of life and health and safety of the people working in it. So that's in some ways separate from union organizing. It's something that unions protect people from, but a change in an at-will state status would not change necessarily whether or not there were more or less unions in that state. Except one of the challenges to organizing a union in a shop is that um, you can be at, in an at-will state, you can be fired at any time. Mm -hmm. And so if you're trying to organize a union and you're fired, you have very few protections from that in Vermont. And so <clears throat> the, the bill that Joey spearheaded this biennium and that passed really right at the very end, was that the last day? It was close to, yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> shortened the time frame between when folks, um, or really clarified the time frame between when folks start having a conversation about forming a union and the union becomes official as a mode of protecting the workers in it. And so that time that someone can be let go for being a rabble rouser <laughs> um, is much more clarified. And so the people doing that are more protected while they're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, Joey, do you happen to remember if someone wants to look up this bill, do you happen to remember its number? S254. Thank you. So for anyone who wants to uh, read up the details of that bill, if you go to the legislators, the legislature's website and in the search, you can do S254 and it should pull up. Thank you for that. Thank you. I think it also gives, um, it also gives opportunity for someone who's trying to organize um, the ability that the employer needs to um, uh, give that person at least 60 minutes to meet and welcome all new employees and explain the benefits contained in the union contract. And um, this had been a problem before that there was a sort of a wall um, between new employees and, and the union. And that again, made it more difficult uh, to um, invite people to join the union. And I, I wanna also just mention one thing which is called the agency fee, which has been a problem over the years where you can be an employee in a union setting and you don't pay um, an agency fee or a, a shared fee that covers at least the part of, you're not paying union dues, but you're paying something because, and the thing was that uh, in, in some parlance, they were called free riders. They're mm. not paying anything, but they're benefiting from the contract from the um, salaries that they're earning, and perhaps even from the duties that are required of their job. Um, and so we thought that that was unfair. And um, I know about 10 years ago, we attempted to pass uh, uh, an agency fee and we, we actually got the numbers. It was in the waning days of the legislature when all good things happen. And uh, we actually got the votes and um, uh, a Republican legislator stood up and called a point of order as the, we were just about ready to vote. And he said, there has been a Scribner's error. And the speaker called us all up to the podium and uh, the lawyers were there to discuss what that meant. And indeed there had been some mistake in the way the drafters had written the amendment and it was called a Scribner's error. And so the speaker had to find for the Republicans point of order. And after all this hard work, we didn't get that. Oh so, my um, goodness. It was a, a very dramatic end. And my Republican friend and I, unfortunately for my reputation, were caught on WCAX news at six o'clock pointing fingers at each other outside the house. Oh, and. No. Uh, uh, he and I, to this day, have uh, remained a friendly relationship. He has let, since he had left the house afterwards. But um, th those were some of the battles we've had to fight over the years, and it's been like inch by inch getting um, um, some things that we thought were more equitable to people. Mm. And so, when we think about sort of um, the popular imagination around unions and some of the challenges that have happened. Um, you know, partly because of corporate media and partly because of um, the fallacies of, you know, 
humans and what happens when they organize together over history, um, that, that clear guideline around people having an hour with their union when they first start is the opportunity for unions to really get an equal voice with a new employee before say management is able to um, confirm bias or create bias against the union and against the power of the union. And when people it's, um, you know, this agency fee, it's really pretty incredible that whether someone is a member of a union or not, they still get to experience all of the benefits of yes. being in an organized shop. The negotiations, the protections, um, and then within sort of the next step out from that is within a state that has a strong labor movement, even if the place you work is not organized, you experience the benefits of all of the organizing that the labor unions in your state are doing. And so the incredible expansions on workers' compensation that we passed this year in order to protect people who might get COVID in the workplace, that was not part of workers' compensation until this year because COVID didn't exist, obviously. But infectious diseases are generally not part of workers' protections for workers' compensation. And so because of the labor movement in Vermont, any worker in Vermont who gets COVID on the job will be protected and covered. So their time that they need to take off while they're sick will be covered. If they pass, death benefits will be paid to their families and any long-term health costs, even 30 years out, will be protected and covered. Um, because we've talked about sort of these lingering impacts of COVID and we're learning more and more about them. And so if someone goes to work in a time where so many of us are scared and warned not to go sort of into the public eye, they go to work, they do their job, they get sick. If something happens to them, the state has their back through this legislation. And that cost is not paid by the employer because we know in small businesses, they don't necessarily have the buffer to cover that if say a lawsuit came. It's covered by workers' compensation insurance, which you know the insurance industry is a national, international industry and they are doing just fine. Yeah, very <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious how, each of you came to the labor movement. Um, I think for me, it was mostly um, uh, stories in my family, I think. Um, my mother's grandfather came from Ireland and um, found himself working in the sleet quarries in Pulteney and Fairhaven. And um, really had a pretty difficult life. It was, a, it was hard work. It was not unionized. Um, and um, my father, I think he came off a, a working farm in Underhill, Vermont, and certainly farmers were not unionized. But I think he, again, was sensitive to the plight of uh, uh, lower income people. And um, so I think it was a value in our house. I remember as a kid when it was sort of a celebration when um, they decided to go to a 40 hour work week. And um, my father was politically active here in Vermont. And I remember that right to work was a big issue in, a, in different campaigns in the late 50s and early 60s. And uh, the Democratic Party worked hard to um, uh, fend that off. Um, and because it sounds, it sounds on the face of it, right to work is a, is a good thing, but it was, and the Democratic Party has always felt, no, it was not a good thing. And um, so I remember those discussions as well. So um, uh, although I did not come from a union family, I certainly came from a family that were union sympathizers. Thank you. How about you, Emily? Um, and before we, get off, I wanna make sure we explain what right to work means to people. But um, for me, I grew up in, um, you know, a few generations of New York Jews and we were Democrats and we read the New York Times and we supported unions. And that was just like non-negotiable. Like <laughs> it was like eating dinner. Like <laughs> it's just, it was what it was and like, you know, that was the culture, that was the conversation. Those were like non, there were very few values in my childhood that were non-negotiable and those were the values. It was dinner and unions are good and you read the New York Times and like you vote Democrat. 
Um, and that comes from, you know, the Jewish workers movement has a long history in America and internationally even. Um, and my, both my grandmother and my aunt were both teachers at a time where that was quite unusual. Um, they both went to college at Brooklyn College, which was free um, and sort of the free college movement in New York is really like very linked up with the workers movement um, and unions. And they both had a lot of agency in their household because they worked and because they were protected. Um, and so neither of my parents were in unions um, and it wasn't really something the day to day life of a union was not something that was talked about at home, but it was just like it was a value that you did not negotiate on because why would you not think that someone should have power in their own workplace and then moving to Vermont um, being, as I said, you know, working in restaurants um, and feeling quite vulnerable as an employee when I started working in social services. Um, both being a, when I, both being protected by the teachers union as a staff member of the school district and having the most amazing health insurance um, and then, and protections, um, and then being able to be a member of the state employees union in an enormous bureaucracy where, you know, the governor is the one sort of deciding your fate when it comes down to it. It was really powerful to see those values in action for me. And so while I'm not a member of a union anymore, it's been really incredible to also like join with my colleagues in the legislature around what is feels like a really clear set of democratic values and to know that the workers caucus is there for that and sort of there for me as a touchstone. Thank you. Uh, right to work. What does it, let's give folks a definition. Is that I, what you wanted I to really do? It. I, I, I haven't reviewed exactly. I don't know if I'd cover all the specifics. Okay, I don't know I'd if I'd cover all the specifics either. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, you know, political speak is a brilliant thing and sometimes one has to appreciate the opposition's skill at it. Mm -hmm. And I would say the Koch brothers and Republicans um, have done an incredible job flipping things. You know, one example is being pro-life when in fact you um, are, you know, endangering the lives of women who are carrying babies, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and another example is right to work. And so what that is, is it's really sort of like a it's a stand in at this point for anti union legislation. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest piece of that is that folks um, are not mandated. It's related to agency fees, is usually the biggest part of it, is that you don't have to pay a fee in a union shop um, if you don't want to join the union. And that sort of slowly er begins to erode. Um, the power of the union in a workplace and the ability to organize, but it sort of stands in for a much larger set of stuff. I feel very aware of time and I don't know. Where we are we good. We have about 10 more minutes. Okay, great. Yes. I didn't remember what time we started. I didn't look. I, I actually okay. wrote it down this time oh, instead of like <laughs> last week when I'm like, how long have we been talking? <laughs> I we talked for like an hour and 45 minutes. I really, I tried to put it up on Instagram live and I couldn't because I only get an hour for that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You should have seen the creative editing I had to do. Anyway, um, that's what happens with good conversations is, mm -hmm. is you lose track of time. Um, and, and I did, we have about five more minutes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so, I want to make sure that if there's anyone out there who either wants to become part of a union or wants to understand more, what are some good resources? Like where can they go for more information or to kind of key into the labor movement in Vermont? Hmm. Oh, well, if people want to learn more about union history, there's always the people's history of the United States. Always a good one. Mm -hmm. um, good read. And there's also a children's history of the United States also by Howard Zinn, which is a really fun book to read with um, sort of like older elementary school and middle school students. Um, and that talks about how the workers movement has protected children throughout the last 200 good years point. in American history. Um, and it's both like readable for children. So those are two really good books if you're a book reader. Um, if folks want to learn more about the labor movement in Vermont, um, both the Democratic and Progressive Party can more than easily help you with that. And then the AFL-CIO is a great place to go. The um, 
NEA, the Vermont NEA, talking to almost any teacher would be a good way to get involved there. Um, <coughs> the State Employees Union. In our region, Robin Risky is probably um, the most active member of the State Employees Union and is on the statewide board. Um, she works at the Department of Health. So she's a great person to talk to. Um, the Brattleboro Food Co-op is um, their union is a member of the AFL-CIO. Mm -hmm. And Ron, who works there, um, is a mm. great person to get in touch with. I think he's um, on the statewide. I think he's a director in AFL at this point. And I, and who else, I, Joey? I, you know, I'm glad you answered that question because I'm not sure. I think I agree with it. going right to um, the unions themselves or any teacher or nurse, certainly, um, uh, would be knowledgeable as well. Um, I don't think I can add anything to that. I, I think your reference to Howard Zinn's work is powerful. And uh, I think it should be required reading for all of us um, and certainly for kids in school that uh, to know his wonderful work that really shone the light on people that often do not um, appear in the history books. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just before we go, any last minute thoughts you want to leave people with? Well, I just want to comment on the professionalism of this fabulous show down there in the southern tier of Vermont. Uh, and we'll certainly try to take some lessons uh, from it here in the northern part of Vermont. Um, it's so funny, I think, how local access TV has sort of transformed the discussion and the forum that we could have these talks. Um, uh, I guess the only thing <clears throat> sometimes that I miss is that oftentimes when um, I do local access, we do have the phone that people phone into. And um, that is always when that phone rings, I'm, I'm sort of pleased and also frightened to death <laughs> as to what, uh, what the caller could be interested in. And sometimes it is not always, um, it's a voice for that person to express how they strongly disagree with perhaps some of the things I was, spe I was speaking about. But um, it's, it's a good job, really been a pleasure for me to be on the show. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, it's been fun to have you. I hope you can come back. Yeah. Um, Emily, we, any last minute thoughts? Well, um, when we started the Montpelier Happy Hour, we really had a goal of um, describing sort of a thematic cocktail every week. And as we have been recording earlier and earlier in the morning, we have moved away from that because it felt like such a mental stretch. <laughs> but what we have retained, and we did have some good cocktails for a while. Um, yes. But what we have retained is a tra trying to have a tradition of a toast, at least with our coffee and teacup. Oh. And um, I would like to toast to the power of when people come together around common cause. So right. here's to your Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ooh, as always, uh, the Montpelier Happy Hour wants to thank all our listeners for tuning in. You can always leave us comments at the Vermontitude Facebook page or SoundCloud page. And you can find us at 2 p.m. every Friday on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro. And Emily, where can folks find you if they have questions? Folks can find me at emilycornheiser.org where you can find a link to my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, email, phone number, and mailing address. And um, every Saturday at 10 a.m., you can find me inside the Zoom for a community conversation if people would like to join. And the address for that is also on my website, Facebook, Instagram, and Front Porch Forum. Wonderful. Joey, um, I know that um, when the new legislature comes in, that this will be your, your final uh, time as a rep. But in the meantime, if people have questions for you or if they're interested in real estate, where can they find you? <laughs> a lot of people are right now. <laughs> I am not as well connected as my younger friend, Emily, uh, but I would give my um, e email address, which is johanna.donovan at uh, gmail.com. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, everybody, have a wonderful weekend and the Montpelier Happy Hour. We'll see you on the radio next week. <laughs>